All right, good morning. Hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, so imagine you're this company, right? And you've got six broad lines of business, uh, ranging everywhere from social media with WeChat, which everyone has in their pockets, uh, to gaming, which everyone's playing at home, to cloud, to everything else, right, advertisement. Um, and it's very broad. And all of these, little, these business groups kind of start off alone and, and independently and evolve with their own architectures. And over time, they grow and they become really big revenue streams of, <clears throat> big streams of business and big, uh, bring lots of revenue to, to Tencent, right? And so, you know, as everyone's talked about today, which everyone's trying to move on to the cloud, what's that one technology that can really um, help standardize <clears throat> our infrastructure at Tencent um, onto, on, onto the cloud? And it wasn't VMs, um, it's really containers and Kubernetes. And this is not a shock for, for everyone, right? And so today, what I really wanted to talk to you is how we're leveraging and building Kubernetes at Tencent and, and our history of, of Kubernetes. So we're going to talk about this through kind of two different lenses. Uh, we'll walk, first, walk through the container history at Tencent. I think this might surprise some people. And then later on, we'll talk about some of our use cases uh, using containers. So let's go. Uh, so history of containers at Tencent. Um, many of you probably don't know, uh, we started really early in 2009, actually. In fact, I didn't know, <laughs> so I did some research with a system called Torca, and that was our initial container platform uh, at Tencent in 2009. And right around 2013, uh, we moved our big data platform onto, onto containers, uh, onto Torca, so that's where the Hadoop on Torca project was born. And then in 2015, we, you know, with, with the event of Kubernetes and open source, uh, we created a new system called Gaia Stack, which is a Kubernetes-powered version of our container platform. And in 2018, uh, you know, we brought that onto the cloud uh, in the form of TKE, which is the Tencent Kubernetes engine, which is really our unified container platform um, handling over 10,000 clusters. And don't worry, we'll get into the details of every single thing on the timeline here, but I just wanted to give everyone a broad overview. So, uh, Torca, right, a little bit on the history. Uh, in 2009, actually, at Tencent, there was no virtualization. So everyone was on bare metal um, and using physical machines. Um, and you know, the, one of the reasons why we wanted to do virtualization was to improve resource utilization, uh, increase developer productivity and reliability. And specifically around resource utilization, it was shockingly low at that time, right? Uh, CPU utilization was hovering around 10% as an average across the entire fleet. So that's really, really low utilization. Obviously, in terms of cost, that was not, a, that was not ideal. And we faced some challenges, right? None of these new technologies like Kubernetes or Docker or Swarm or Mesos or any of these things existed. So when we were thinking about building, you know, a, a virtualization engine, a virtualization engine stack internally, you know, how, how, how do we go about building this, right? So in terms of the technology stack, um, we, in 2007, Cgroups was born. And so by the time 2009 rolled around, we were thinking about this project uh, you know, we really went all in on, on OS virtualization, right? We skipped hardware virtualization with Zen at the time, and kind of, we loved all the virtues of OS virtualization with the fact that it's thin and light, it's quick to start, um, and again, trying to improve uh, utilization, right? Uh, in terms of the orchestration system, not, none, none of these technologies that we love to use today existed, and so uh, we actually found an open source framework called Condor. Now it's known as HT Condor, uh, and that was a open source orchestration system developed out of the University of Wisconsin with about 20 years of experience. So that's what we really leveraged at the time um, for our uh, H, uh, for our Torca stack. I just want to say Torca stands for Tencent Orca. Orca is a killer whale. We were into whales and containers before Docker was, so, you know, just FYI. Um, in terms of the improvements, uh, the one thing that I'll talk about here, if you don't have time, is we really made everything elastic, every single resource. So in terms of CPU, um, I.O., disk, memory, um, network, everything was elastic, even in 2009. That was one of the founding principles of Torca. And the reason is that, you know, we wanted to save costs, but we also wanted to improve reliability and utilization, right? So being able to burst a CPU or burst pa past your memory limit if there was free uh, resources on that box was really handy. It made things much more reliable. You weren't going, going around and killing containers that exceeded their limits. And at the time, you know, when, when, when Torca was running, we actually had some really key internal customers like WeChat um, and SoSo, which was our search product at the time, and things like QQ Zone. So even then, you know, we were landing a lot of our critical businesses um, on top of containers. 
So fast forward to 2013, um, you know, containers were going along on Torca, and people were liking it, and we thought, well, what, it would be a good idea to move our big data platform as well on top of Torca, right? So this is where Hadoop on Torca came along. It was hot. Um, and uh, the thing that was really important for us for big data, obviously showing the sign of the times in 2013, was having 100% compatibility with Hadoop so that our customers, our engineers, did not have to change a single line of code. So in order to achieve that, um, we rewrote a resource, the Hadoop resource manager on top of Torca so that a natively just work with Torca and then, you know, you could just write vanilla Hadoop jobs. And in order for us to speed up some of the performance issues, we replaced HDFS with our own custom distributed file system called XFS. And this really helped to improve resource utilization, um, again, because you're able to virtualize, right, and better bin pack. You got better performance uh, through some of the performance improvements, and it really increased reliability of these, of these jobs. So everything's going on fine, and then 2014 rolls around, and 2014 was when Kubernetes was first released, so 0 0.1. Um, and we were watching at the time, because we were very interested in open source, but 0 0.1 just didn't quite have the features. It didn't have any of the features <laughs> that we wanted, right? So we waited a year until 2015 when Kubernetes turned 1.0, and that was kind of an inflection and a turning point for Tencent and for the container stack at the time. Because while Torca was really great, and we learned a lot of lessons from it, there were some issues with it, right? First of all, there was no Docker support. Docker was, had been around, and we were not using Docker images for dependency management, which is painful. Um, and Torca really relied on a lot of internal Tencent systems. So things like alerting and monitoring and all of that is internal. And so as we're moving onto the cloud and trying to build a cloud stack that our private cloud customers can use, you really can't rely on internal systems if you're trying to build an on-prem cloud solution. And also, we wanted to em embrace open source, right? Um, you know, there's no need to build a lot of this stuff on your own if you can just use open source components. So all of this meant that, you know, our decision in 2015 was to build something called Gaia Stack, which I, I hope some of you are familiar with. And we really built Gaia Stack on top of Kubernetes and leveraging all of the lessons that we learned from Torca. So things like performance, right? Uh, you know, we still had the really great elastic uh, resource management that we built in on top of Kubernetes. Um, you know, this is a, a recurring theme, actually. <laughs> Everyone's building these Ceph-based distributed file systems, and we did that, too, to increase performance and reliability. And again, for CNI, for the network fabric, um, we built an open-source plugin called Galaxy, uh, which is our own high-performance net net network fabric, which really in increased um, performance, right? From the reliability angle, you know, especially in 2015 at the time, some of these uh, open-source components didn't quite have the reliability characteristics that we needed for our core business. And so things like the Docker registry, uh, we built our own highly available Docker registry that could scale to Tencent's needs. Um, we built hundreds of additional systems and cluster and node metrics by default into the stack. And this really meant that we were able to really monitor every single angle of the, of the technology and of the, of the system to improve reliability. And a really key point here is also we built, you know, we modified and we made changes to Kubernetes so that there were no single points of failure anywhere. And we really made it extremely highly available which is really important. And, so, and also some of the features that our developers really wanted included things like you know, CI, CD, and native DevOps integration right, with Jenkins, um, GPU virtualization. I think we were one of the first uh, or only people to, to, to folks to, to really build GPU virtualization right into Kubernetes, and things like being able to do advanced canary deployments. And we'll get in, into some of these details later as we look at some of the use cases. And so 2018 comes along, and um, we're kind of in this situation where we had a container platform for, for um, Tencent Cloud called TKE, Tencent Kubernetes Engine. And internally, we had built Gaia Stack, which is a really, really powerful, highly skilled um, container platform, also on Kubernetes, uh, that you know, had a lot of usage and a lot of adoption at Tencent scale. Uh, and so what we decided ultimately was to actually unify the two platforms. So, so today, TKE uh, powers both internal and external customers. So it's the same, it's the same code base, it's the same platform, that powers both our cloud customers and private cloud customers, as well as all of our internal customers. And you know, getting that leverage and that kind of dog fooding really helps us push uh, the platform forwards. So we just talked a uh, little bit about the history, um, and and uh, you know, we just talked about this, right? Ten years of uh, container experience. You know, it's it's also fully compatible with Kubernetes uh, and a unified cloud, cloud platform. So we just talked a little bit about the history. Um, next, I wanted to walk through some of the use cases internally at Tencent that is using Kubernetes and, and TKE today. So we'll talk a little bit about gaming um, and its different workload, which is 
um, you know, very different uh, custom Kubernetes workloads that doesn't really quite fit within the mold of some of these CRDs that exist today. We'll also talk about WeChat Pay uh, and its challenges around stability, right, and scaling. And lastly, we'll talk about advertising and, and its big data requirements that places uh, some, some different requests on, on, our, on our Kubernetes engine and on TKE. So gaming, uh, gaming is huge at Tencent, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people know. Uh, you know, all the, most of the popular games are either built or made or licensed by Tencent. And there are some interesting architectural challenges from a gaming perspective. Um, because we acquire a lot of companies and we, you know, we've, we've got hundreds of thousands of long tail games, uh, and a lot of these services tend to be pretty monolithic, right? They're, they're big, heavy services. Um, they require a lot of resources. They spin up independently. And a lot of them are black boxes that, because through mergers and acquisitions that we can't really change. We can't change the configuration. They require static IPs. And, and most of them are stateful. So all of these things really don't lend itself really well to working with, within the Kubernetes mode, right? And so how could we solve some of this, right? Well, in terms of the large monolithic uh, architectures, we, we could solve that using the, uh, the, the excellent dependency management that's brought along by Docker images that we support as part of Kubernetes. Um, something that's extremely important for gaming is to have static IPs for a lot of these services. So when they crash, right, when they come back up, they have the same IP because we can't change the underlying architecture of some of these third-party uh, licensed games. And the thing that I think uh, some other folks talked about today, which is really around custom resource management on Kubernetes, you know, this is actually very interesting. It's a recurring theme. We also built something called TAPP, right, which really helps to manage things like being able to really bash deploy um, outside of the stateful set uh, CRD that's offered so we can deploy much more quickly. Um, and so also being able to just, you know, when, when, when a service dies, to not have it be automatically clean up because they're stateful and you want to wait for an operator to go and restart them so you're not losing state. So all these, all these changes that we're making to the Kubernetes engine uh, was, is what really allowed us to land some, this gaming workload, which is a, a very more critical um, uh, revenue driving use cases on top of Kubernetes. So next I want to talk about WeChat Pay, right? Uh, everyone's got WeChat in their pocket and it's really got massive scale, right? You know, a billion, a billion monthly active users, a billion financial transactions a day, right? It's through Chinese New Year, there's huge scale of everyone sending red packets. And what's really important here with WeChat Pay is the stability angle and the scale, right? You know, how do you support the sheer size of customers? And really critically, how do you maintain the reliability and stability? And again, I think this is where the 10 years of experience that we've had operating containers in production really come into play, starting all the way from Torca, right? So building the Kubernetes engine and, and uh, uh, making improvements to make sure that there are, it is HA and there are no single point, points of failure anywhere, right? Uh, having hundreds of d additional built-in system metrics means that we can operate and debug and troubleshoot much more quickly and, and bring more stability to the engine, right? Uh, a really critical thing that we built into our engine is the ability to do live upgrades. So, you know, we can upgrade the underlying platform without inconveniencing or disrupting the tenants that live on top, right? And things like isolation between networks and being able to control the, the amount of bandwidth that's, that's utilized between tenants. Again, all of this helps to make, make, make um, Tencent Kubernetes engine a really stable product for internal and very, or very critical use cases like WeChat Pay. And so the last use case uh, I want to talk about was advertising, uh, Tencent advertising. And this is really different, right? This is kind of more of a big data workload and a machine learning workload. So, you know, a lot of our engineers, our AI engineers, want to use things like Kubeflow. Um, they want to run big data. And that really, you want, you want to be leveraging these really expensive GPUs. And traditionally, you couldn't do that um, in a virtualized way on top of Kubernetes, right? Um, there are some challenges around working with big data with small files and distributed file systems. So we made some changes, right? We improved the small file um, capability of, of our Ceph file system. That really increased performance by about 10x for our big data workloads. Um, because we have a full Kubernetes enabled, 100% compa uh, compatible with Kubernetes, you could just drop your machine learning workloads on Kubeflow onto, onto TKE and they would just run, right? Uh, and the GPU virtualization here, I think, is, is really important. This is actually a really awesome part of, of TKE. You know, we're able to bring GPUs online, virtualize them, and really go all the way down to a tenth of a GPU and vent that out to our customers. So where traditionally you had to buy these expensive GPUs and they sit around on racks, maybe they're allocated to a different group and they're being used maybe half the time, you now are able to centralize the GPU resource uh, and, and, and share them out across the entire company. Right? And, and be able to prioritize them, and you can allocate GPUs based on your resource needs. 
and you can pick the different kinds of hardware that you want, and being able to virtualize across that broad spectrum really meant that, one, we were able to lower costs, and it means we didn't have to buy as many GPUs, but also teams are much more productive, right? Again, it's back to the virtualization model and being able to pay uh, for what you use. Right, so today we talked about uh, a couple of things. One, which is our story, our history of containers at Tencent, um, a decade of production experience, starting all the way from 2009, where we're, we, you know, two years removed from the launch of C groups, we went all in uh, OS virtualization, all the way to today in 2019, where uh, we have TKE, which is our unified uh, cloud container platform. Um, and what's really important here is TKE is, for us, a unified solution, right? We are using it for internal uh, key internal customers, like WeChat, like advertising, and like, like gaming. And when you use it on top of Tencent Cloud, you're using the exact same code base and the exact same stack for our customers. And so we think this is really important um, for us, for Tencent, to be able to do things both internally and externally. Only by doing this can we stay close to the customer um, on, on, on cloud and understand their needs because we're using all of our products internally. And what I wanted to leave everybody with today is, is really uh, a couple of things, right? One, you know, none of this would have been possible, moving all of our cloud onto all of our businesses on, onto containers. None of this would have been possible, I think, to get this kind of adoption without the open source, um, without the open source efforts of the Cloud Native Foundation, right? I think having Kubernetes, having Docker, having all of these things be, be open source is really what helps to drive adoption, being free and open. And it, it lets everything cross broad, you know, geopolitical boundaries and makes things free and easy to use, right? And we talked about being 100% compatible with Kubernetes, and I think that's really what's driving um, the success of virtualization containers and Kubernetes forward. Um, and, you know, I just wanted, what I really wanted to get across was that open source is this great idea, and nowhere do I see it more embodied than the Cloud Native Foundation and really pushing container and cloud technology forward. Thank you very much.